I'm Damien Lillycrap, the Bare Naked Economist. I'm talking today about intergenerational equity. If you are young or have more than 10 years left to work, you should listen. I'm an Aussie, but these are global issues, so you'll hear me talk about them as our problems. I refer to a video by Ray Dalio. Ray runs one of the largest hedge funds in the world. He's one of the smartest investors in the world. Watch his video. We all know about global warming and we are starting to act to take out insurance against it. But racking up economic debt loads is already causing pain and suffering with more to come for the next generation unless they speak up. Young people of the world, wise up. One of the smartest investors in the world, Ray Dalio, is telling you that debt levels in the US are twice as high as they were at the start of the Great Depression and that from such levels, things typically end badly. I've also written a book telling you that issues from today are being swept somewhat under the carpet by borrowing from tomorrow. We might think back over our experiences and think, well, they've fixed it before, but they didn't fix it. They put it on the credit card. They've made potential issues worse as they hope that something will come along to fix it. The hope has been that economic growth will pick up to be faster than the rate of debt growth so that the problem will decline. But this hasn't been happening. Debt has been growing faster than GDP, and all serious forecasts suggest that this is going to continue or get worse based on current entitlements. So we have juiced up the economy by adding debt to get higher levels of growth than we would otherwise have got. And now we are hoping that growth will spontaneously be high enough to get us out of these issues, perhaps jump-starting it with more debt, using debt to get us out of a debt problem. It could happen. I'm not saying it can't happen, but is that the best we have? What if growth doesn't come? Interest rates can't go much lower. And even if they did, I'm about to argue that that causes other problems. We can experiment with policies like money printing, but I argue that that won't work. And do you really want to experiment with your economy? So it sounds like a pretty poor path. But the incentive for the authorities is to keep trying these short-term fixes like lower rates, rather than taking some hard decisions and doing things to fix the long-term issues. To reiterate, these short-term measures are adding to the long-term issues, and as Ray Dalio has told us, we are already at levels that are a concern. Surely we need to start looking for a better path, one that guarantees we resolve our long-term issues, rather than adding to long-term issues and hoping a solution will come. Ray gave us three rules in his video about keeping debt in line with income and productivity. Had we followed these, we wouldn't be where we are. But we didn't, and they don't get us out of the problem. Ray does give us some mechanisms that he says will lead to a beautiful deleveraging. Deleveraging is reducing debt levels, getting down from the high ledge we are on. Now, it turns out that I disagree with the mechanics of what Ray suggests, but at least Ray is putting forward a potential solution. All credit to him. Many people are pretending it is not a problem, hoping that a solution will come. Ray has at least suggested an approach. The big question is, do you support it? Because it will impact you. Ray's suggested approach that you need a mix of cutting spending, reducing debt, redistributing wealth, but also money printing. He is a big believer in money printing. Now I go into more detail in another YouTube video that you can find on my site. But in short, while I respect Ray, here I disagree with him, particularly about money printing. Printing money is mainly about interest rate policy, encouraging more debt. It favours the haves over the have-nots. Most of Ray's mechanisms, including money printing, are redistributions of wealth. Democracies have ways of doing redistribution from one group to another. So no backdoor measures like inflation, please. Borrowing and not paying back means we have been living beyond our means. If we have been living beyond our means, the natural level of GDP is lower than what we have become accustomed to. That is to say, the natural level of spending, the lifestyles that we have become accustomed to, need to be a little bit lower to be sustainable. Something needs to change. This isn't a rabid political view. This is just maths. So either we can take some tough decisions now, or we can continue to hope for growth and get deeper into a hole, in which case, we will have to make tougher decisions down the track. 
Tough decisions mean changing what is happening now. If something doesn't add up, then something needs to change. Some groups are going to end up worse off than what they are now. If you aren't part of the process, you are likely to wear the cost. Rather than taking tough decisions, we have had continually lower rates, which has fostered higher debt loads. Lenders should have to worry about lending too much to the wrong people, but continually lower rates means that bad lending practices have not been punished. This encourages more bad lending, a process they refer to as moral hazard. Lower rates also punish those trying to save for retirement. Lower rates also skews the playing field between countries while tariffs and other protections are frowned on. Low rates also tend to distort asset prices. They tend to be good for the haves, but not so good for those saving to buy assets such as houses. And higher prices tend to mean a riskier system. I also worry that low interest rates are the cause of some of the high unemployment rates and low wage increases that we are seeing. Making the cost of automation lower so favouring robots instead of labour is great for jobs while you are putting in the machines, but not so great when they are in. If rates cycle up and down, then that would be fair. Those disadvantaged in the dips would be advantaged in the ups, but we have had 30 years of falling interest rates. We haven't meant to keep moving rates ever downward. We just assumed that growth would be stronger than it turned out to be, over and over again. Are we being responsible in this assumption? What if the economy was a 20-year-old son? A dad might not mind helping his son out for a while. But if a son continues living beyond his means year after year and keeps telling you that something is going to change but nothing does, Does it matter if the dad still has room on his credit card, if the son is living beyond his means? By continuing to fund his son, the dad isn't really helping his son in the long run. So does a good dad keep lending, hoping that things will come good? Or does he cut back his support and force discipline from his son? This is where we are at. We can't be sure that the economy won't pick up, but how long do we keep going on without a plan B? Ray has provided a plan B, reliant on printing money, but I argue that this is really just more interest rate policy, more plan A. Now, a really important concept is that when we measure GDP, we are measuring the spending in an economy, and that is quite like measuring the spending of a person. While a person that is better off might spend more. Just because a person is spending more doesn't mean that they are better off if this is funded by debt. These intergenerational issues are all around the globe. Debt issues are well publicized in the US, Japan and parts of Europe. And there aren't clear solutions if things don't pick up beyond trying lower interest rates. China also has intergenerational issues. They look to be building more than they need in order to keep growth at target levels that they want. This is a pull forward of building, basically pulling forward jobs from the future. So all major economies seem to be trading or boosting growth today while creating bigger imbalances for the future. The fact that all of these economies are struggling means that it is less likely that they will get the growth they hope for. If there was a clear engine of growth for the world, then other economies could piggyback off it. But if all the major economies are borrowing, let's say stealing growth from the future, then the hope that significantly stronger growth will come seems all the more unreasonable. And not having an alternate path seems more and more unreasonable. We often talk about a global village. This is like a village where all the adults are supporting themselves by putting their expenses on their children's credit cards. All the adults are hoping that their incomes will jump. But the only way to get a material jump in income is if someone in the village loses income. Hoping for growth is great, but wouldn't it be prudent to have another plan? In my book and in my economic machine critique, I explain how printing money basically works for reducing interest rates. More of what got us into the problem. 
This helps things from collapsing, but it doesn't fix the problem. Support is okay to prevent collapse, but central banks can't fix the problem. We either need growth or we need governments to restructure things to get out of this quandary. The incentive for the authorities is to keep doing what they are doing, getting some short-term gain and hoping there aren't long-term issues. Overall, we should demand an equitable solution and we should ask for certainty because if growth doesn't come, the current approach doesn't provide equity or certainty. It puts us deeper into the hole than ever. Another incentive for authorities is to use nationalism to try to distract people if the economy is soft. I believe we need to be clear to the authorities around the world that both of these approaches are unacceptable. Now growth may come, let us hope, but we should set things up so that we get an acceptable outcome even if growth doesn't come. I believe we need a framework where we are more certain of getting equity and where we reduce rather than increase the chance of bigger issues down the track. I believe we can set up such a framework. This is my framework. I believe that we should set things up with stabilizers such that budgets automatically come back into balance and debts are brought under control. I believe that central banks need processes to ensure that interest rates on average are at a more neutral or fair for all levels over time. Now, balancing budgets and normalizing interest rates will impact growth, but I don't see growth as being the direct priority. I think we have wanted growth to try to get jobs, but I would argue that the way we have tried to get growth has ironically cost jobs longer term by pulling forward growth and by making automation so cheap. So let's be clear that we are targeting jobs and make these the explicit focus, not growth. We don't just have to aim for jobs. We either need to get them or to support the unemployed, or we will end up in a downward spiral. Let us do this in as free market way as we can, but there is no free lunch. This will have to involve transfers from those that have jobs to incentivize jobs for those that don't have them. This is insurance, paying a little extra so that we have confidence that A, there will be enough jobs, and B, that things are less likely to blow up down the track. I also believe that such a framework will get us out of the current situation, and that if growth was destined to come, that it would come anyway under this framework. Low interest rates, money printing, QE, etc., might help the pain of transition under such a framework, but without such a framework, these low interest rate policies are anesthetic without the operation. So where are you at? Are you confident that growth will suddenly come when for 30 years we have been juicing the engine and it has continually disappointed? Do you think we need another plan, a framework that will restore balance whether growth comes or not? Or are you happy to keep adding to the credit card and hoping that the credit card doesn't explode? If you think it is worth thinking about this, share this link. I've written a book if you want to know more. It's an easy read, but it's all there. If you are 50, you could still be working for 10 years or more. When I talk about the next generation, I'm talking about you too. And there are issues in every major economy. Thanks to Ray Dalio for making a video to try and advance the conversation. I don't agree with everything he says. I think my framework is more robust. But well, what really matters is more people understanding the risks and deciding what they want to happen. Things are unlikely to change unless you are clear about what you want.